started. We're really excited to have you be with, your, with us here tonight. I'm going to start the sign-in sheet. Um, please make sure that it makes it all the way around the ring. Um, members are on the front couple of pages and the candidates are in the back. Please sign the sign your name. And Lindsay is going to introduce our speaker. Okay. All right, guys. So we have Mr. Tom Watson here today. Tom has served as BKD's Dallas Fort Worth Managing Partner since 2012. However, come June 1st, he will assume the position of South Region Managing Partner. Prior to, assume, prior to assuming the managing partner role, Tom was BKD's South Region Healthcare Industry Leader. He has 27 years of experience providing audit and advisory services to some of BKD's most complex clients with an emphasis on healthcare organizations. Since moving to Texas in 2004, Tom has been, an instrumental, has been instrumental in building BKD's Texas healthcare practice, which has resulted in BKD being one of the largest service providers, providers for Texas hospitals. Tom is a 1992 graduate of Harding University in Searcy, Arkansas with a bachelor's in business administration. He earned one of the highest scores ever achieved on the CPA exam in Arkansas and received the Elijah Watts Sales Award for his outstanding performance. He is a fellow of the Healthcare Financial Management Association, finance chair and executive committee member for the Dallas Music Dallas Summer Musical, as well as a board member for the Dallas chapters of the First Tee American Heart Association and Mothers Against Drug Driving. Please join me in welcoming Mr. Tom Watson. Uh, if I had known you were gonna have to read that, I would have like, like really redacted the line. I'm sorry about that. Uh, thanks for having me here. So, a uh, couple of caveats. I'm coming off of a sinus infection, so can you all hear me okay? Because this is about as loud as I can go right now. And we'll be done in five minutes if my voice gets out. So hopefully we can get through this presentation. I, I want to introduce a couple of folks that are here with me uh, this evening and then have Lauren say a couple of words. We have Amanda Clary. Amanda works with me in the Dallas office and coordinates recruiting for that office. Lauren works in the Jackson office and is the, the campus lead for Ole Miss. And, Lauren, I'll let you take a board. Yes, thank, uh, thank you all so much for being here tonight. I am the oldest campus recruiter. I've been at BKD for six years now. Um, I'm also an alum of Ole Miss, so potty potty. Um, really fun to be here tonight. Um, interviews for our summer leadership program and for um, internships in Texas are the Thursday following your spring break. So I believe that's March 21st. So I think you have until this Friday to sign up on Handshake and to sign up uh, on our BK website. I had hands raised for how many juniors we have in here tonight? Awesome. 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 Um, how many grad students? Seniors? I miss seniors. Okay, we've got a few. Cool. Well, thanks so much for coming. Um, I will be here following the presentation. So if you have any questions about any of our offices, how I can connect you to any of our offices, please come and see me. Would love to get you connected and hopefully if you're in town um, at one of the locations you're interested in during the spring break we can get you an office visit there too. So, okay, we'll hand this over to Tom. Thank All you. right, thank you. So I guess you're supposed to start every uh, presentation like this with a joke just to loosen up the crowd or something but accountants aren't the best at telling jokes so but I'll give it my best shot here. So this is actually a true story. Uh, my son is now a junior at the University of Arkansas uh, doing mechanical engineering. But at the time that this story happened, we were living in Little Rock. And he was about four years old and going to daycare uh, while his mom and I, and I worked. So the daycare that we went to was attached to become part of our church. And so we knew a lot of people in there. And we had friends that had other children in there. And so one of our friends was a guy named John Crabtree. John was married to a pediatrician, so he was playing house dad, and so he was volunteering all over Little Rock doing stuff, and one of the places that he volunteered was the Little Rock Zoo. So, if you volunteer at the Little Rock Zoo, they let you take little animals out to various places, like a daycare where my son Parker and his son Carson went, and you can show off these animals, kind of in a show and tell, and you can imagine for four-year-olds, this was a pretty big deal, right? So, John, John didn't really grasp the, the intellectual capacity of four-year-olds very well. So, the first thing that he did when he pulled out this little furry critter, I don't know what it was, let's just say a rabbit, and showed it to these four-year-olds and says, hey, boys and girls, this animal is a mammal. 
Do you know what a characteristic of a mammal is? Four-year-olds. Okay. Believe it or not, one of them raised their hand and said, yeah, mammals come alive from their mommy's tummy. Pretty good answer for a four-year-old. So that only encouraged John. He said, I'm going to double down. I'm going to ask another question. That's right. Do you know what another characteristic of a mammal is? And they just went, nah. So he said, well, look, 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 look here. I have hair. And one characteristic of a mammal is they have hair. At which point, my son Parker raised his hand. My daddy used to be a mammal. <laughs> it is what it is. Sometimes you just got to roll with it. You know? <laughs> All right, so let me tell you what I want to do tonight. I'm going to do a little bit of telling you about PKD. I'm not going through puberty, I promise. That was, that was a mistake. A little bit about going through BKD, but I really want to talk to you more about preparing for a career in today's world. So we're privileged in BKD that our chief operating officer is the chairman of the board of the AICPA, the kind of the pinnacle of the AICPA. And so I have borrowed a presentation that Eric has given a number of times, and I've BKDized it a little bit. So what I want to do is spend the next 30 or 45 minutes just talking to you about some of the trends that we're seeing happening in public accounting, not at BKD, not at KPMG, not at Deloitte, at everywhere, and try to help you get ready to what you need to do to prepare for that. So with that, we'll go into just a little bit about what we're seeing. Now, I do have to give a little bit of an advertisement for BKD. Obviously, we're here, and we would love for you to come to work with us. We're recruiting for the whole footprint. So if you see a dot on the map that you like, talk to Amanda or Lord and they can help you. To give you a little bit of perspective about my firm, I have been here since I started my career. It's been around nearly 100 years. We're about the 12th largest firm in the country. Uh, revenues over $600 million, 38 states, uh, 17 states, 38 offices, nearly 3,000 people. If you come to work for us, you're going to see a lot of cool stuff and a lot of interesting things and a lot of hard problems. So. If you're interested, please sign up and come and, and, and chat with us to interview. But I'll talk to you a little bit about how BKD is addressing some of the issues as we go through. Now let me talk to you about how things can change. When I started my career in 1992, that was a laptop. It was this big, and it, it lap in the best sense of the word. In 1992, that was an Excel spreadsheet. 13 column paper. Some of us might remember 13 column paper. Do you, you remember? I, good, good deal. Boy, that was, I could make a beautiful 13 column work paper. Let me tell you. I used to do my homework on it when I was in school. Yeah, yeah. Boy, it was so nice. It, it was, was pretty green, cool. You know, this was voicemail. You know, we, you would walk in every day from lunch. Hey, do I have any slips of paper? And that's what you would look at. Uh, a couple of other fun facts. There was no email 20 years ago. I remember the day we got email, 1998. It was a big deal. That was the coolest thing. He believed email. But 1998, six years after I started my career. Uh, one of the best skills you could have as an accountant in the 90s was to be able to run a 10 key real fast. How many of you know what it means to run a 10 key? Basically, you have a 10 key, an adding machine, and you run it as fast as you can, and you would practice with a phone book. That's what interns would do their first week. We would give you the phone book. Y'all know what a phone book is? And you would take the phone book, and you would put the numbers, and then check it. Cool fact, I broke this finger one time. I learned to 10 key left-handed and write with my right hand. That was a key accounting skill. Uh, we used calculator tape with audit evidence. So one of the things we would do is we'd run that 10 key, and you get a big old long strip of paper and if you were really neat, you would fold it over and it would fit perfectly on that work paper. It was really cool. Work papers were actually made of paper back then. Now they're all Excel. And we spent days, literally days, taking a client trial balance, manually keyed into that laptop that we looked at, and then another two or three days trying to figure out why it didn't balance because somebody always transposed a number. I mean, those were the things that we did as new accountants in 1992. Now, I want you to think about the skills that that took. Did you have to know a lot? You just have to kind of be able to do things over and over again. You had to be able to run a 2 key. Not a whole lot of accounting skill needed by brand new grads. I guess that's why we only needed 128 hours back then because all we had to do was key punch stuff. But that was, that was not that long ago. And things are really, really changing. So I want you to watch this video and just look at some of the things that are happening in our profession today. UK has voted 
to leave the European Union. The dawn is breaking on an independent United Kingdom. An emergency meeting to solve the worst refugee crisis since World War II. Korea has fired a ballistic missile. We will make America great again. We live in extraordinary times, bringing fundamental change to the way we live, work, think, and interact with one another. It's an age of innovation and acceleration, one marked by the rapid drumbeat of disruption. The World Economic Forum calls it the fourth industrial revolution, a transformation unlike anything humankind has experienced. The challenge, as stewards of the global accounting profession, is to not only imagine the possibilities, but to reimagine the profession and ensure we continue to power prosperity, opportunity, and trust. If we go back a thousand years, progress was so gradual that it could take a century or more for the world to appear different. Today, the rate of progress seems to happen overnight, and the term new normal no longer means new. It is disruptive, unexpected, and represents an analytical thinking that confounds logic. Futurist Ray Kurzweil says that with today's rate of innovation, the 21st century won't bring 100 years of progress. It will bring 20,000 years of progress in a world we literally cannot yet comprehend. A world shaped by robots and artificial intelligence that drives seismic shifts in society, that helps us live longer, and reimagines the skills we need to succeed. Already, it's challenging our concept of work, amplifying protectionism, introducing new risks, and creating a maze of regulatory complexity. We must ask, what new services will clients and customers demand to meet their next challenges? How will firm and corporate business models need to evolve? What does the world of auditing and finance look like in the years to come? We have an obligation to the generations that follow to consider these questions, to untangle this web of complexity and uncertainty. For this is the new normal, extraordinary times that demand extraordinary leadership. Concerned about change and how we keep up with that. And you see quotes like this all the time. The pace of change will never be as slow as it is today. And you know, it's just it's just a fact of life. And you, you hear things and you hear people talking about change and that you've got to grow a change and move people to change and all that stuff. One of the concepts I want to get you all comfortable with is that what you're learning in school today is vitally important, but you better not stop learning because what you're gonna be doing 10 years from now will be a whole lot different based on some of those things here. So this concept of lifelong learning is going to be really, really important. And you know that the issues driving this are all over the place. Geopolitical shifts, you've got the rise of China as an economic power, you've got stuff going on in the European Union and what's gonna happen there. That all creates regulatory complexity, you know, good grief. Have you ever talked to an audit partner that went through a PCAOB inspection? It's not a fun process, but there's all these things that are happening with regulators, and because of the regulators requiring so much more of our profession, we're having to find ways using technology and other sources to be able to address risk inside an audit or inside tax plan. And then after that, just changes in the workforce and financial challenges, it's just, it's just crazy. And so one of the things I want you to understand is we're not just talking about change in the accounting profession. It's really change in the overall global business climate. And those who are going to succeed in the future will be those who can identify and basically agree to follow through with change. Anybody know what that is? Somebody give me a guess what that might be. Anybody? 
It is the first digital camera. Okay? First digital camera, uh, late 1970s. Not the best concept in the world, but it was a digital camera. It didn't use film. Nobody had heard of that before. And you know who had the opportunity to take that and run with it? This company. Anybody remember Kodak? What Kodak made? Well, you guys just have used digital cameras all your life. They're actually with this thing called film, you know, that you had to put in like a 35 millimeter camera or you had the, the you know, the, 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 what was it called, the Polaroid thing that you would shake and, and all that good stuff. That's Kodak's business. They sold film, they sold a lot of film, and they made a ton of money. And you know what they said about that digital camera? You know, that'll never take off. It's not going to happen. We're going to stick to making film. So today, what do we use? How many of you have a camera that uses film at home? <coughs> not, it can't be your parents or your grandparents. How many of you have, that use a camera with film? Nobody, right? You know what Kodak is today? Bankrupt. Out of business. You gotta be ready to identify change. Another example is Netflix. How many of you have a Netflix account? Better said how many don't? You don't raise your hand, don't raise your hand. So um, Netflix came about as an answer to Blockbuster. How many of you have ever rented a video from a Blockbuster store? You have you, okay. This is more relevant. Nobody remember Kodak, everybody remembers Blockbuster. So you remember what you have, what happened if you uh, if you didn't return the, the VCR tape back or the DVD back on time at Blockbuster? What'd you get? Late fees. Late fees. So what was Netflix still? <coughs> no late fees. Keep them all you want. Just send it back. So Netflix was trying to do this kind of with a mail order thing, and you know what? They were kind of struggling. They really were. Blockbuster had all this physical presence. People would go to these stores and they liked touching and seeing. I remember it. I'd go in and I'd flip through the DVDs. Oh, I want to watch that movie. And it just wasn't the same with Netflix at the time. So Netflix was struggling. So they actually went to Blockbuster and they said, hey, what? We think we can take your service and our service and we can really pair up. We will sell you 49% of Netflix for $50 million and then we'll work together and partner and move forward. The Blockbuster board looked at each other and they said, you know, Netflix is gonna go out of business. We can do a little mail order on our own. The future is, uh, is DVD rentals with stores that people can walk into, so we'll just turn that down. Netflix said, all right, fine. So they said, okay, we're gonna go ahead and we're gonna work on the DVD rentals, but we're gonna start going into streaming and production. And they got into the original content in 2012 after starting streaming in 07. In 2018, they have 125 million subscribers. You know what the market cap is of Netflix today? Checked it just a little bit ago. 155 billion. 155 billion? It's something like that. Some crazy. It starts with a B. Okay? It's a lot of a lot of billions. That $50 million investment would have taken Blockbuster to, through the roof, and they'd still be in business. But you know where Blockbuster is today? Bankrupt. They didn't identify the change that was in front of them and, and adapt and grow with it. You know, if you look at the, uh, the S&P 500 and the companies that are out there, kind of the biggest in the, in the U.S. and the biggest in the world, in the 1950s, the average time that a company stayed on the Fortune 500 was 61 years. In 1980, it was down to 20 years. Now they believe that up to 50% of the companies in the Fortune 500 will not be there 10 years from now. 75% by 2027 will not be there. So you can just see this pace of change is picking up and picking up and picking up. And as you look at that from a company perspective and like management just globally of people that are running businesses, they want to leverage that. They've observed the Blockbuster story. They've observed the Kodak story. There's hundreds of those out there you can use in examples. And they said the only way that we're going to be able to survive in the future is to make disruption a business opportunity versus a business risk. And so they're working to find people in, that have skills to be able to leverage that. Some of the things that we'll see, and these are, a, a, I'm going to kind of pivot into how this is affecting public accounting. Things like cognitive computing, that's a fancy word for making computers think like people. In-memory computing, which makes it faster, visualization, advanced analytics, cloud computing, blockchain, which I'm going to not talk a lot about blockchain, but we're just not seeing much of that yet. 
but we are seeing a lot of robotic process automation and a lot of artificial intelligence, and we're investing millions and millions of dollars as a firm and as a profession into doing that. So let me talk to you for just a little bit about how I think you all, as new accountants coming out of school, and we as the folks that are helping to drive accounting in the next 10 to 20 years, are going to have to adapt to that. We're going to have to talk about it with not only how we do our services to our clients, so I'll give you a little bit of an indicator of that, talk about the talent and some of the skills I think it will be vitally important for you to have, and then I want to finish with just positioning how you can make yourself the best candidate to move forward in this new world. So let's start with services, and I'm going to start with tax. So when I started, my, my first internship, I was actually, I did three months as an auditor, and then I did three months as a tax preparer. And then when I came back to work, I said, what am I going to do? And they said, you're not doing tax. So either I was a really good auditor or a really bad tax preparer. I still don't know to this day, but I moved into audit. But during the time that I was doing tax returns back in 1991, uh, what I would do is I would take a, sh a sheet of paper that the client would send in. So think about a W-2 or a 1099 or some tax document. And I would look at it, and I'd say, block 1A, $226. And I come over here to this little form and I'd write 226. And then I go down and just all the way down, and we would send that piece of paper overnight to some computer processing lab. They would send it back to us. I would look at it and like, dad gum it, it should have been 262, not 226. I'd fix it, I'd send it off again, it would come back. It was a weeks long process to get a tax return done manually like that happened up there. Today, you know what how we do that? You come to work for us as a tax accountant, if you're going to scan that same document into a, 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 a printer or into a scanner, it's going to populate the form automatically for you. We use a software called SurePrep, which is pretty common with that. Think about the different skill set. What was I having to do? All I had to be able to do was move a number from here to there. Now you know what we want you to do when you come out of school? We want you to understand enough to be able to review it and make sure that the numbers are correct and that they have the right meaning. The different expectation and the different skill set. Think, frankly, it's kind of exciting because moving those numbers around was boring as all get out, but it was kind of all I had to know coming out of school. The other thing that we're really looking at from our tax preparers going forward, industry-wide and also in BKD, is being better advisors. The days of being able to just do a tax return are going away. Literally, people can take a picture of their W-2 with their phone using a project we have called Tax Caddy, and they'll get a, w, get a 1040 in the mail. No human interaction. Oh, we'll send somebody to review it, but no human interaction. So what are they going to pay us for if we've got a computer that can do a 1040? They're going to pay us to advise. We're really proud as a firm that we have a product called Simply Tax. It's a podcast. If you want to be a tax nerd, go listen to Simply Tax. It's actually on the AICPA website because they've linked into that into their tax reform uh, toolkit. You can also find it on our website, but it is just cast by podcast after podcast of very detailed technical tax stuff that's being done by a person that's worked with us for, I think when he started it, nine years. Came to us and said, we want to start a podcast. It's on the AICPA website. That's the kind of future thinking we want people to have. I'm going to be a leader in thought, not a leader in key punching numbers and writing stuff. <coughs> when it comes into audit, things are a little bit different. You know, in audits, we're trying to look at risk and we're trying to make sure numbers are materially correct, all the cool stuff you learned about in auditing class. But when I started, we would decide if numbers were right by taking a sample of 30 items out of probably, I don't know, 50,000. And if everything of those 30 was right, we would kind of go through our little uh, buying process and say, well, we can go through statistical theory. And you know, if 30 are right, if it's a valid sample, the whole thing must be right. And you know what happened? They were never all right. And if we happened to get one of the 30 that was wrong, we'd work with it. But if all 30 of them worked out of that sample, we'd move on to the next task. In the regulatory world we have today, and with the advances in computers and data analytics, you don't do that. You know what we do now? We audit 100% of transactions. And we look for people like you that can come in and not figure out if there's an attribute in one of those 30s that's wrong. We need you to look at data and trends and say, hey, using something like MindBridge, an analytics tool, have, does this spike make sense? Or does that indicate a potential error? Cognitive thinking skills are going to be much more vitally important coming out as an auditor now than when I came out of school. We're using tools in BKD like BKD Big Data and Analytics 
and BKD quietly that is bringing stuff into our network so that we can analyze it in kind of this uh, AI, you know, artificial intelligence fashion to help us look for those kinds of things. And this is really going on in the whole industry. I think uh, tomorrow or the next day when is, uh, your, is Matt's coming? So one thing that the industry has said is that the way that we used to audit, not 1992, which is ancient history, but like 2014, just a couple of years ago, is not going to work going forward. We're going to have, we're, you know what we're worried about as, as CPA firms, frankly? That Google figures out a better way to audit a company's books than we know how. Think about it. Google's doing everything. They're spending billions of dollars on R&D. What if they were to come up with a better solution and convince banks and the, and the government regulators that, you know what, that financial statement audit that's kind of in the bedrock of that things work, it's not going to be a thing anymore. Google's going to do it. We don't want that to happen. So we're completely redesigning as a profession our audit approach to look at more of the data trends and analytics versus attribute testing that we've done in the past. And you'll, you'll hear them tomorrow about if you go to the, the awards dinner, is that right? Or something like what? You might say Honors. Like, Honors. Honors College. Yes. Honors. Uh, it's called the AICPA Dynamic Audit Solution, DAS. And it's a complete change in the way that the standards applying to auditing will work. So, my one recommendation, pass the CPA exam before all that changes or you'll have to learn something else. But uh, it's going to basically move from today's audit approach to a common new set of standards, if it all comes to pass. BKD is one of the largest investors with the AICPA in developing that. And I'm proud to say that our chief audit officer is one of the two uh, key architects of this. But you've got basically, uh, outside of the five largest firms, almost all the rest of the firms, like, like number <coughs> seven through 100, are investing and working in this dynamic audit solution approach. And it's going to create something that we think will be a much more relevant audit product 10 years from now than what we have today and protect us from the disruption of somebody like a Google coming in. And this is basically our Kodak moment. So if we don't change the way we do it today, we are worried that the digital camera will come and we're going to be stuck printing films. So that's some of the things that we're thinking about as a profession. You know, some of the things that, that, that you see as key drivers, technology we talked about, methodology is DAS, new skills is going to be another key one. What we're also doing as a firm, and what I think will be exciting to you, is we're developing specialties far beyond just audit and tax. If you were to go across our south region or across our firm, we've got far more people than ever working in unique specialties like this. Things that aren't audit or tax, but that are highly value added to our clients. They keep us in front of them and basically that they're willing to pay good money for. So a lot of times what happens with these folks is they start out as auditors or tax preparers, but they evolve through this lifelong learning approach into being able to do cyber type work, business valuation or big data and analytics. So things like that might be a career path that you take in the future in addition to audit tax. You know, when you talk about talent, one of the spooky stats to me is that by 2030, according to the McKinsey Global Institute, nearly 375 million people across the globe will have to change their occupations and learn new skills primarily because of technology disruption. So how do you get to 375 million? Think about the person in a third world country that right now is doing farming with a horse and a plow. It's out there, right? So technology disruption would be a tractor comes in and does that. Think about somebody that's putting together something manually that's going to be taken over by a robot. Think about an accountant sitting around key punching a, or writing out numbers in a form that's going to be taken over by uh, RPA. So those types of items are the things that are going to drive the need to learn and switch uh, jobs and get new skills. And so these are the top 10 things that, that are going to be needed by folks if we're succeeding <laughs> in this new environment. Complex problem solving, critical thinking, and creativity are probably three of the things we work with and look for the most in our accountants today, in our, in our people we're trying to hire. We need you to be smart about audit and tax, don't get me wrong. But I also want to make sure that you've got the ability to just think big and to look at problems and solutions that might be a little bit outside the box or look at trends and be, you know, the critical thinking skills are vitally important. And as we look at various schools across the 
the country, a lot of the accounting schools are implementing different, I, I guess, courses to help with that because that is going to be the way that you'll be successful moving forward and instead of being able to just do something over and over again like filling out a form. And I think the thing you're going to have to learn to really grasp is this concept of learn, unlearn, relearn. So what might that mean? So for me, there I go going through puberty again. For me, it was early on, I got really good at 10 key. I had to get really good at Excel. I got really good at uh, writing a memo. I ultimately had to learn how to do public speaking. For you, it might be you're going to come out and you're going to be really good at some of the Microsoft Office types of things, but you're going to need to learn how to do more, I don't know, business analysis type work. You maybe need to have more skills in IT or controls all of them versus just matching numbers up. Things like that are going to be the learn, unlearn, relearn. The folks that will succeed over the next 30 years are those that are willing to say, you know what, I've done pretty good so far, but it's time to reinvent myself. And the pace of that reinvention is going to have to be a lot faster than probably what I've ever had to do. Everybody, you recognize that in assembly line, right? That wasn't that long ago. See all the guys standing around working on that car? Here's what that looks like today. Where are the people? I, have you ever been in a car production facility like this? It's amazing. I was uh, in Germany and had a chance to tour the Audi uh, plant. And this is all it was. You know who I saw walking around the plant? Engineers, scientists, engineer, engineer, engineer. I didn't see a person walking around in greasy overalls anywhere. And the point's not that, okay, now all those people are out of the job, but if you wanted to succeed, you had to go from being the person that was bolting on the seat to being the person designing this robot. And that's a different skill set and a different thing that you have to learn. And frankly, probably a more financially supporting <coughs> career. So let me bring this to account. How in the world would that translate to public account? So this is a uh, joint venture operating agreement. It's an 86-page PDF. And so for years, you know what we would do for our new accountants? I would give you a list of things and attributes in this document that I wanted you to summarize for me. You would come in on Monday and I'd say, What's your name? Bill. I need you to take this document. I need you to go through and I need you to find all the uh, capital contribution requirements. I need you to find the term of the, of the partnership. I need you to tell me how the waterfall works. You'll learn what that is one day if you don't know already. You'd spend about two or three days writing this, reading it, summarizing it. I'd look at it and I'd be like, okay, help me find that. We go back and forth. Okay? That was what you were doing in 2014. Today, we have a program called Cura. Today I would bring this to you and I'd say, Bill, I need you to run this through Cura. You would take it in and you'd run it through the scanner and it's going to put out in about 19 seconds this document that has everything that you were doing for me over three days that is absolutely 100% accurate. We've had a whole team inside our firm in conjunction with three other uh, peer firms working to identify and teach Cura to read these 86 page documents and take what used to take 20 hours of your time into 10 minutes. And then we can spend our time looking for the riddles versus summarizing the data. This is a real life example of artificial intelligence that's going on today in public account. So one thing you have to ask yourself is, good grief, is that going to make us irrelevant going forward? Our account is obsolete. And the short answer is no, just like you still have people that work in car factories. But you're not going to be able to be the bill that summarizes and reads a document for three days. You're going to have to be the bill they can come in and say, hey, Tom, I was looking at this, and this has a really quirky distribution provision for partner C, and if we don't get that right, we'll bust the financial statements. And you're going to need to know that within probably your first six months of working. Just the way it is. So the skill set that you're going to have to learn and get to is going to be different. Accountants are going to have to be the, develop the skills and be valued in this new environment going forward. The top three skills that finance executives say they're looking for, 67% say technology skills are needed, 27% increase since 2014. Communication skills, 25% increase. Critical thinking and judgment skills, a 13% increase. I mean, all those, two-thirds of these finance executives say these are the top 
three skills we're looking for. You don't see in here anywhere they're really good at math. You don't see in here, boy, they, they know gap inside and out, or they know the tax code better than anybody. Those are kind of baseline expectations. What they want to know is then can you take that base level knowledge and do this kind of stuff. Frankly, something I learned after about 27 years in Pupka County, that's the fun stuff. Doing all the compliance and billing out is just boring. So I'm excited for you all because you're going to be able to do early in your career the stuff that it took me 20 years to get to do, but you're going to need to really work to study and get these skills. I don't know if you got a class on this here. You probably do. But, you know, this is where lifelong learning comes in. Read a book. Watch a TED Talk. Spend some time with an executive or a peer and say, hey, how do you do this? Spend some time with an engineering student. They're kind of good at some of this stuff. They're kind of quirky because my son's one too. Don't worry. I, I get that. But, uh, you know, they can help you figure out some of these things that might be good going forward. One of the things we're doing in BKD that's really fun is our new service line or new, new product or initiative called BKD Edge. This is our innovation approach. And we're using this concept called innovation tournament. So an innovation tournament is basically American Idol meets Shark Week. And we bring in randomly 35 or 40 people from across the firm, usually starting with seniors all the way up through partners, and we give you a problem to solve. How do we take technology to make our customer experience better? Might be one of the topics. And we have each of you come in and you bring three ideas, you sit around a table and you talk about the three ideas with your peers, and then you pick one of those three ideas to get up and tell the room. And we vote. And then you, the top, you know, 15 out of the 30 move forward, the other 15 they pair up, they do it again, they do it again, until we get down to the top four ideas and the best ways that we can then take our, uh, oops, that's not supposed to come up like that, take these ideas and bring them to market. And you're getting to do these after about, I don't know, three and a half years in the firm. So this is just an example of one of our innovation tournaments. We now have over 100 products in our pipeline, many of which were developed by folks that are five years or under in their career. And this is one of the ways we're trying to make sure that we're bringing a diverse group of thought and diverse group of experiences together to be able to bring new products and services to our clients. And it's going to, I really think, transform, transform our firm and the way that we're, that we're moving forward. You know, one of the realities with public accounting and with the really all organizations is that we used to have this idea of a triangle. So you know how we hired in public accounting? In Dallas, as a managing partner, how many hire Amanda? 35 people a year all in? We hired 35 a year, and we knew we were going to have turnover. And my goal was over time, the 35 would turn into maybe three or four partners at the end of the day. And that wouldn't be bad. Three or four people try to get there. But then we would, you know, ultimately we just kind of kept hiring big at the bottom. But because of these differences in the skill sets that we have today, what we're, what we're seeing some firms go to is that problem they're outsourcing or using automation instead of hiring as many people. And so if you look at some of the stats about new accounting grads that are being hired across the country, it's actually down. You know, uh, 8,300 new accounting grad firm hires have decreased in that since 2014. Now that hasn't been the case in our firm. This has been at some of the larger firms uh, that are using more automated processes or that are hiring non-accounting students to fulfill some of those skill sets that they need. And the thing, I think the learning experience for us is that in order to stay relevant as a people that are trained in accounting, we've got to have that as our base set with all the skills, but then figure out why some of these other people have an experience around IT or controls or so forth so that we are more valuable. One of the things the AICPA is really trying to make sure of is that the, the, the need for CPAs in public accounting firms stays strong. This, this is a little bit misleading. I almost pulled this slide out because of the way that it looks. The point here is that many of the firms that are getting into services and processes that require skills that we don't learn in accounting but we need to learn in addition to accounting are going outside of the profession to fill those needs. And so as CPAs, future CPAs or current ones, it's important that we continue to refine our skill sets as we fall. The other thing that I think is really important is that you get your CPA exam out of the way quickly. And you will hear Lauren and Amanda preach over and over again that when you come to work for us, it's an expectation. 
And it ought to really be a personal expectation that you set for yourself because it is the kind of the, the hallmark of success in our profession. And so if you look at some of the reasons that you get CPA license for prestige and respect, competitive edge, more money over time, you'll make more money as a CPA than not. But the other thing is that it's, the, it's just really an indicator that you have the ability to refine yourself, to adapt to some of these new skills going forward. So I'm going to give you some things that I recommend at the end, but one of the things that's the baseline recommendation is as soon as you can start studying for that CPA exam, start studying. And as soon as you can start taking it, start taking it. And do not fall into the trap of waiting until your fourth, fifth, or sixth year out of school to get that thing out of the way. Make it a priority. Make it a priority fast because there's so much other stuff you need to learn besides sitting around and studying better. And it's a, it's a big time suck. If you're, not, if you're not there, you need to be able to invest that time somewhere else. There are resources out there. Obviously, we, we provide Becker to our, our uh, new hires. Uh, once they uh, come to work for us, agree to a full-time offer. But the AICPA has many other resources out there for you as well that you can use in order to become a CPA as quick as possible. So how do you position yourself for this? And, you know, I, I, one risk of a talk about all the change going on that we can't just sit around and like do audits the way they do today is it's kind of spooky. If you can look at it as spooky or you look at it as, as uh, exciting, personally I've always found it exciting. But how do you position yourself to be ready for that going forward? So here's a few things that I would recommend. First of all, think about how you handle criticism and failure. If you're really good at failing, but then failing fast and learning again, you're going to adapt real well. Life moving forward is about a lot of things you do wrong and how you learn from that. Our whole innovation tournament that I talked to you about, I think we'll have 300 ideas come out of that start with a tournament and four of them will come out. Does that mean we have 296 failures? Well, we have 296 things that didn't move forward, but we have pretty good ideas, but we can only work with so many. It's going to be just like that with you. You're going to do things. It's going to be a, a start and a stop. Those of you that can handle criticism as a learning opportunity versus a ding on your self-confidence are going to do much, much better. So be ready for that when you come out. Develop very, very strong baseline skills in just the basics of technology today. Excel, Word, PowerPoint. But my recommendation is if you want to do some light reading, start learning about data analytics or IT controls, AI, those types of things. If you can come out and work one of those software programs or to understand kind of what MindBridge is or whatnot when you come to work for a firm, you're going to be far more valuable to the folks that you're working for than if you just know the basics. But at a minimum, you need to know the basics. The other thing that you may have seen up there is that, we, that people skills was a big item going forward. You're not going to be able to hide in your queue and just do work over the next 10 years. When you've got data, you know, cognitive abilities and critical thinking, you know, one thing that makes you have to do, talk to other people and tell them what you saw. And if you're not able to get involved in organizations and really be social and develop those communication skills, it's going to be a lot harder for you to do that effectively. So we will oftentimes hire people based on their ability to communicate more so than their GPA. I can guarantee you if I've got two people that all things being equal, academically they look the same, but one's the communicator and one's not, we're going to hire the communicator. Because we need people that are competent in front of our clients and competent getting their ideas and the things they discover across. So the best way to do that, don't go back to your dorm or your apartment. Get out and get in an organization. Get involved, be a leader. Learn how to refine some of those skills. Commit to lifelong learning. I wish I could tell you that schooling and learning stops when you finish in two, three years, whatever it is you have left. It's just the beginning of the race. It's more fun stuff, and it's all open book tests going forward, so that's kind of good. But you still have to learn and learn and learn. What was it we said earlier? Learn, unlearn, relearn. It's, it's just the reality, and it's going to be important to keep up. And then the last thing I'll tell you is please live 10% outside of your comfort. A lot of times folks will ask me about the, the best advice that I can give for a successful career, not just in accounting, but in business and so forth. Get outside your comfort zone. The minute you get comfortable doing something and you think you've got it down, raise your hand, ask for something else. The reason I've been with BKD 27 years is every time I felt like I was kind of bored and plateaued, 
I was able to raise my hand to the firm, found me something else to do, and I'm forever grateful for that. We have a lot of folks that come to us and they get really good at one thing and they just say, I'm comfortable, and they stop growing. And you need to kind of start to embrace the idea of the phrase, if you're not growing, you're dying. And that's one of the things that's, that's true in, in, in this living outside your comfort zone. That's how you continue to grow. So there's a lot of stuff that's changing out there. A lot of exciting stuff that's changing. And so, you know, overall, the AICPA is talking to you about going beyond and being more than an accountant. And I hope that you can all kind of learn to get the baseline stuff out now and then commit to some of those things moving forward. It's been a real pleasure to talk with you this evening. I'd be happy to answer any questions that you might have about maybe BKD, about how BKD or the profession is addressing some of these things, or any others that you might have. Yes, ma'am. Uh, so, you know, all of us right now, we're in our first year having our data analytics master's program. Um, and so I was just curious from the point of view of a partner firm in general, um, what would you expect like from someone coming in as a first year accountant having that degree showing that they've done masters in accounting data analytics? What from a practicality standpoint of what they would be doing as a first year accountant, what would you expect them to be able to do? Well I you know, we're still figuring some of this out on our own. Uh, I think what, we're, what we would expect to see is that some of these software tools that we're implementing, even if that's not one that you work with in school, you're going to understand the concept behind it. Think about, think about statistics. How I many of y'all still take business stats or whatnot? That's going to be some, some of the stuff in data analytics that you're going to need to be able to, to apply quickly. So where I used to maybe take that list of 30 items and look for an attribute that was off, I'm going to need you to look at that data and say, okay, this is one standard deviation above the mean, and that's way off the charts, and how can you apply that knowledge? It's probably going to be less, can you work a specific software program, and more, can you apply the concept? But I think that's going to be a big part of what you do early in your career, especially once this dynamic audit solution takes off. Other question? Yes? Yeah, going off what she said, with the way technology is changing things, do you think it could be more beneficial to get something like a master's in accounting and data analytics instead of just a master's in accounting? You know, um, there will be a spot for both, but long term, I think having that, the way I see the world moving now and just where mm -hmm. we're spending our money is investing in those technology type items. So if you, if you have the time and the ability to do that, I think it would serve you very, very well. Yes. Talk about the skills that accounting change and then how do you change them? Do you think the actual first grade of accounting higher will go down? You know what I think you have right now? I really think there's a little bit of a wall where maybe some of the skill sets that people were getting in school, that the pace of change in the programs wasn't kind of keeping up with the pace of technology, and you have things like the data analytics masters that wasn't around five years ago. So I think that as you start to see those people come in with those skills, it will put that. But what you've got right now are firms like, gosh, I need somebody that understands data analytics. Let me go over to this degree, and I'll just teach them the basics of accounting, but I really need that data skill. When so when you use the analogy of the assembly line, there's way less people there. How can accounting be different? How can they still keep the amount of honors there and so much stuff? Well, that's what we have to come up with different services. So you saw the slide about all the boxes that we got that aren't audit and tax. That's where we're going to go. You know, the whole concept of, of the public accounting really has always been we're meeting a regulatory requirement. Going forward, we've got to meet a value requirement. And so as you look at the things we're investing our money in, I was just on a call earlier today thinking about this new service we're going to offer and how much money we want to invest in. And it's something that we don't do, but the thing is it's a wide open field. So we'll, Maybe my base audit people will go down, but I'm going to hire just as many more over here as long as we can kind of get outside our comfort zone and do things we haven't done before. Yes? So it sounds like you did a pretty exceptional job on your CPA exam. In terms of helping us uh, think about how to study, can you explain a little bit about your general approach when you took the exam at the time, and then also um, with all the new technology that's available for, for incoming? People to leverage, what What do you kind of see incoming um, accountants leveraging and being successful using? Uh, you know, the, so here's here's what actually happened. I uh, I was going to school at Harding, which is up in Arkansas, and I had three hours to graduate. And so 
instead of staying in school to take three hours, for some reason, I was in a hurry to go to work. So I said, I tell you what, I'm going to figure out a way to take three hours, and I'm going to work full time, and I'll take this three hours. The three hours was CPA study exam, or CPA exam study class or whatnot. So a CPA prep class. And the reason that I think I did well is I had a test every Friday that I had to go take on what I had to study the week before. And that was going to make a, I, I had a target of a GPA I wanted. And if I didn't pass those tests, I was not going to hit that target. And so I was very committed to knowing the material because I knew every Friday I had to be able to write it down on paper. And I think the reason I did well, it was just that process. So the people that I see struggle today are those that, I'm gonna sit around and I'm gonna study better for a minute. Oh, hey, Game of Thrones just dropped. Gotta drop that real quick. There's no process. But you got the date coming up. You've got to have a reason in order to, to pay attention to what you're studying and just, just commit to it. And if you do that, it'll be over before you know it. It is it's a hard exam, okay? And it is not an impossible exam. And a lot of you can pass it the first time. How many people from Ole Miss passed really came to our office? Three? Uh, no, we had one this year. One? So one we this had eight out of our 14 interns. Eight of our 14 interns we hired in Dallas passed the exam before they came to work for us full time. And we paid each of them $5,000. Not a bad deal. So, but you know what they did? They took the summer and the early fall and they just said, we're going to knock it out. We talked to them about it. And it's all process. I don't know any, I can, I've never opened Becker. The way I studied, I had a book that was this thing. But, you know, it's different now. But if you do that in kind of a regimented approach and set goals and meet them, I think we'll be fine. <coughs> yes, sir. Um, you talked about how y'all like to recruit people with critical thinking skills. Um, can you tell me like, how you identify those skills in people and what students can do now to improve those skills? Well, <clears throat> you know, we'll ask a few questions that will, I can't tell you what they are, you might guess the answer, but it's, it's really, it's not a stumpy question, it's just how would you approach a problem? And so when I'm interviewing somebody, I might lay out an example of a problem and say, what would you do? And there's really not a right answer. What I want to do is think, okay, how are you thinking about that? Not that we're trying to stump you, not that we're just, it's just, hey, how would you approach the situation? The other thing that we, we correlated, frankly, is those that can come in and have a good conversation in an interview are usually pretty good at critical thinking because when a good conversation, you know what you're doing, thinking on your feet. You have no idea what a man is going to ask you, but if you can carry on a conversation for a while, then you probably have the ability to adapt on the fly, and that's a lot of what critical thinking is. So we have baseline expectations. We need you to be a a good book student, but also need you to be a person that's going to be able to, to work with our teams and with our clients. Other questions? Yes? With the uh, um, December tax reform, how was that, uh, how is that affecting the simply tax app, and uh, how are you all adjusting everything to it? <laughs> you know, the neat thing about the tax reform is it gave us unlimited material for simply tax. It's like a so a 20, 30 minute podcast that you look at. So we've got thing after thing after thing. What we use though is simply tax now to narrow down very specifically to problems faced by not partnerships, but partnerships in oil and gas or partnerships in asset management and stuff like that. So, you know, we think, uh, we're talking about the need to add values. Tax reform is one of the best opportunities for public accounting firms, and in my case, BKD, to add real value to our clients because we can study that thing, we can know it better than anybody, and I can come and help bring strategy to our clients. But that's the way we're using Simply Tax for tax reform. Yes? Yeah. I'm just curious, uh, how did you get into kind of the healthcare side of things? Is that something that you enjoy, or is it kind of like a snowball effect from your first year? <laughs> so, it, it's, uh, well, first of all, I guess I wasn't very good at tax, and they're not, mostly non-taxable, so that helped. You know, here's what it was, and this is an example of you know, trying to push yourself a little bit. I wanted to work on the biggest dadgum client in the office, and you know what it was? Hospital. Uh, hey, I, that's the hardest one people talk about. If you back to Mulroy, Baptist Hospital in Mulroy back in the day, biggest hospital in the state of Arkansas, most complex all that we had, I'm in that. And, you, and then what happened, I liked the material because it was hard, but I really liked the people. That was really big. And the other thing is I think it gave me the opportunity early on to do some of the stuff you saw up here with the boxes and the extra stuff. Probably after my second year, about 50% of my time was audit, and 50 of it was other stuff, consulting, 
forecasting, forward looking versus retroactive looking, and that industry had that, and that really just sucked me in. So for the next, I don't know, I still do it. I still have hospital clients today that I work with. And it was all because of the, the fact that it was a hard thing to work on, and then I got to do stuff other than audit early on, so I got to kind of expand my skill set. Probably one more question, then we'll be right at the 7 o'clock hour. Anybody else? Yes, so you have talked about um, like the specializations. Do you think that in the long run, well, I guess a trend that people I'm saying now are people are starting to specialize early on in their career. Do you think in the long run that could be problematic with so many people, I guess, um, pigeonholing themselves in the industries? As far as maybe, um, I guess what I'm saying is once you decide which industry or specialization you want to yeah. be in, like you're kind of stuck. So here, uh, short answer, yes and no. So if the reason that you specialize is you're willing to learn so much about something that you're going to be the best there is at it, then that's great. But that also would indicate to me that you're smart enough to spot trends, and that would be a trend of when my skill set's becoming stale and I need to learn, unlearn, relearn. So if you wanted to tell me, like today, if I was doing the same thing I did with hospitals in 1992, I wouldn't be very successful. And the same thing with you. If you got really pigeonholed in one thing, and you just had your head in the sand and didn't look up at the, the Netflix, uh, you know, Blockbuster, Kodak, digital camera thing, and didn't see that trend coming, then it would hurt you. But if you can keep your head up a little bit, <coughs> make time to pivot and learn more, then you'll be fine. <coughs> Clients will hire people that are more specialized. Well, one thing I like to say, specialization is recession proof. Because no matter what, people are going to hire the best people. Yeah. And if you're the best, because you pigeonhole yourself to specialize, that's fine. You just don't stay there. Oh, one more. Yes. How do we catch those trends? It seems like one of the most critical things you can ever Read, listen, read, listen, talk. Just keep, just don't get so, there's so many things you can do. I mean, you can waste your time. And I'll use that word. It's like I'm talking to my son. Don't waste your time playing game of the, playing up. What's the dad young thing? What's the big game now? Fortnite. Fortnite. Yeah, Fortnite. I would do the dance, but it would be really embarrassing. So, uh, no, you don't put that camera up. Uh, but uh, I'm like Parker. Quit doing that. Let's go. Let's go read the Wall Street Journal or something. I'll be honest. That's where you catch trends. You can't, you can't subscribe to a, like a news bulletin or something. You just have to pay attention and read. So keep your head out of it. I mean, it's fun to, fine to have fun, but make some of that downtime, personal development downtime versus brain off downtime. Make sense? All right. Thank you all. I really appreciate your time. Thank you. Go beat Kentucky, please. <laughs>